Welcome to the Funnel Lake County Historical Society's Thursday Fireside Chats. It's a video podcast series that we're going to be starting bringing on different guests to discuss different topics of history in Funnel Lake County. Today with us we have Mark Weber, who's a former city council member and city council president in 1989 and 90, and then 1994 and 95. Um, we are really happy to have you on the program today, Mark. Our first guest ever. Um, we're experimenting with this, seeing how it's going to go. Um, Mark's going to talk to us a little about Rooping Leather and um, that building coming down, the expansion of Giddings and Lewis, um, and some of his overall time on the council. So welcome, Mark. Thank you, Ben. Uh, we have today uh, a pretty filled agenda. Um, you gave me the council members that served with you um, back in the 80s and 90s. Um, and you told me that you, as a council member, there weren't term limits and you actually took a break and you had a kind of a self-imposed term. You want to talk a little bit more about that and sure. kind of your tenure on the council when you came on? There was a referendum that had, had been introduced um, for term limits. And term limits generally were thought of at the federal level. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's that's what it's thought of. But a lot of people thought that members of the council had spent a lot of time there. And maybe they should have term limits at the local level. So a referendum was put out and it was voted by the people to say, yeah, there should be term limits at some point. Um, I had served uh, a total of six years up to 1992. And I said, hey, I'm done. I'm taking a break. And after uh, 1989, 90, and 91, mercury annexation, roofing leather, combustion turbines, wet industries, annexations, sewer town battles, a lot of those things, um, it was time for a break. Yeah. So that's uh, that's very interesting. I know that, you know, you talked about it being involved in the federal level. Um, you know, the New Gingrich Congress in the 90s, I know that was when it was very popular, literally being discussed with, you know, members of the public that they wanted these term limits. And it's interesting that we still don't have term limits on the federal level, but the city, the city uh, government responded. And, you know, wow. obviously there's term limits now, of, um, three terms for six years. And so that's some interesting insight there. Uh, but talk to me more about Rooping Leather and um, for folks that don't know kind of what Rooping Leather was and what happened to to Rooping Leather as a, as a business and entity? Uh, Rooping Leather, this is kind of a, a page that came out of the paper just before Rooping's got torn down. You can see the old building. Um, and, and some of the people inside, in fact, this little thing down here, it mentions that it was given to the Historical Society. So somewhere you have this <laughs> That's awesome. in amongst all your stuff um, here. But this was a Rooping building, and that was a building that was... This, a lot of controversy with it. Controversy mainly, um, it went bankrupt on or about 1985, somewhere in that time period. I had a father-in-law who worked there for many, many years. Uh, uh, my wife's uncle who worked there as well. Um, a lot of people, Gordon Lair was one of the people who worked at, uh, at Roopings, et cetera. And one of the things I know, I got on the council way back because of sewer flooding, actually basement flooding in my uh, my own residence, and uh, but before that, I had talked to Gordy Lair about doing what, uh, uh, you know, these incubator type buildings and helping the people who had lost their jobs at Rooping Leather, um, because that was a major thing. Two, three hundred people had lost their jobs, and it was never to be open again. Well, Rooping Leather sat there during the 86, 87, 88 time period. We did not own it. Because they had closed in 85, is that they correct? They had closed okay. in 85. And remind us where Ripping Leather was um, in the city? South of uh, Johnson Street, actually right now, Marine Credit Union yep. is on the northern parcel. Uh, the, where the bus station now is, the transfer station is right at that point. That's where Ripping uh, Leather was located. Um, and a lot of the, you know, the, I guess it bubbled to the top almost about the time I became president in 1989. Uh, we had just lost city manager Dan Thompson. We were looking for a new city manager. Um, we brought uh, Jack Howley on uh, in that 1989 time period. And uh, Bill Raymer was an acting city manager at the time. This was about the same time as there was a building off of Brook Street that was called West Ice and Storage. Major fire, burned to the ground. There was a water tower that was in the middle of that building. And uh, it was still standing, you know, it had been there. But Rooping Leather had been closed for quite a while. And there was a fire there. 
Okay, and uh, people, you know, drew some concern. What if it got out of control? This is a large, vacant industrial building. What if it got out of control? And I remember Tony Leon had asked, uh, I think it was then Assistant uh, Fire Chief Wayne Parker. Tony Leon was with the reporter, correct? Tony yep. Leon was with the reporter. He asked Wayne Parker about the water tower and, you know, what happens if there is a fire, you know, adjacent buildings, et cetera. And there was a water tower adjacent to the roofing weather at the time. And um, he made the comment that that water tower might buckle and would fall and collapse and you'd have the, <laughs> this large amount of water, et cetera, et cetera. Well, pointing out to Tony, I pointed out to the West Ice and storage, hey, there's a water tower in amongst this that burned to the ground. It didn't buckle or whatever. And this one was full of water. At any rate, this caused concern, a lot of concern within the community. And something must be done about roofing leather. Couple of problems. Once again, the city of Fond du Lac did not own the yep. roofing leather building. It was in bankruptcy um, and they were sorting through it. And I could show you in the abstract uh, that we eventually, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, but in that abstract, there were millions of dollars of liens against that property. And there was one other problem, major environmental issues. Mm -hmm. Chromium, uh, volatile organic chemicals, VOCs, asbestos, Etc. Over the years, uh, people had gone in there and actually salvaged, not legally, but actually went in there and tore up stuff, took stuff out, wiring yeah. and copper stuff, um, which caused a concern for us. Um, I remember as president, uh, Greg Stensman and some of the people from the, you know, asked, because what happens if there's a fire? What is the condition? Yeah. And in that uh, picture that you have there, you'll see that there, uh, from the paper, there were pictures off of the roof where it showed holes in the roof, holes oh, yeah. in the skylights, etc. And if you walked into the roofing building, um, you would find where the water was leaking in and the floors were warped and, and metal plates where these big uh, carts had been, you know, through the aisles had been taken with leather on, they were gone scrapped out, and fire protection wasn't there. Yep. Okay. That had been removed. So uh, an obvious of, hazard to the city. Hazard to the city, hazard from the standpoint of adjacent to a major industrial concern, yep. uh, Giddings and Lewis, yep. hazard in general. And people breaking in there, kids breaking in there, uh, you know, there were comments about drug parties in there and all sorts of stuff. What we did in 1989, secured the building, okay? Um, in that press conference, if you will, when we walk through the building, um, we showed them where certain doors were locked. They said, don't think that these are the doors that are going to be locked tomorrow because we lock different doors. Mm -hmm. We don't want people to know what's being locked inside here. We're trying to keep people out, but we change them from time to time. Therefore, if the police have to enter it yep. and try to catch them, well, they'll they, catch them. Right? Yeah, they, that's, yeah. that's the thought. So that, that goes on into the 89s, uh, into 1990, we started having a lot of closed sessions. Yep. What are we gonna do with the uh, roofing leather property? And uh, obviously, there was again, pressure that was building from the members of the Association of Commerce. What are you guys gonna do? Giddings and Lewis at that time had a president called William Fife. Bill was a kind of a, a, a well-known, excuse me, spin the down, but, that's Bill Fife on the cover of Fortune magazine, wow. standing in the wheel uh, <laughs> and talking about how he'd like to expand in the city of Fond du Lac, but not with that roofing building next to him. Okay, So major political pressures coming from a lot of the people in the business community. you got to do something. It wasn't that the that's council... A, I mean, that's a big... That's a uh, a big force your hand there when, you know, the, the well, CEO of, of, you know, Giddings and Lewis says, well, we'll expand, but not with that with thing. With that thing, not with that thing there. And, uh, you know, it was, it was a, it was a major concern to obviously to the members of the council. They were doing a lot of stuff. Staff was doing as much as they could. DNR issues, type of cleanup, asbestos removal, doing what we could but also at the same time realizing we could not just simply do this. It was in bankruptcy. So you have to worry about the bankruptcy courts. You have to worry about the environmental. If you start messing around, you touch it, you own it type of thing, mm -hmm. which we did not want to do. And it, like I said, the pressure on the council 
a lot of those members of myself, yep. uh, was to get something done. Okay, we're entering now the time period that probably from a consequential standpoint, and a lot of people in the city, every, every council, every Congress, everybody says it's consequential as to what's going on, but you have to understand in the year 1990, uh, Ralph Lyson was actually president of the council from 90 to 91. Ron Nelson came in in April of 91 as president, okay? okay. Just so you get an idea, I was yep. gone by that time. Yep. Not gone, but on the council, but still a member. We get into 1991. This is when Mercury was proposed to be annexed and did get annexed. Yep. We were in closed sessions um, relative to an expansion warehouse uh, properties. We're building a warehouse for Larson Company. We had an X land. We're pulling in Mercury with this. It's a one time shot, all this kind of stuff. January 1st comes, and that's when roofing or uh, uh, Mercury's annex hit the annexation hit the council chambers, right? And so while we were still in closed session, and I've got tons of minutes that they all look like this, they're yellow, they're 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 confidential at that point in time, yep. many items were going on. You know, talking about a number of annexations, a number of problems, uh, the combustion turbine thing was just beginning to kind of filter up. Uh, requests were coming in for a lot of different things, but the mercury thing took center stage. Yep. And that took center stage for January, February. But at the same time, we're in closed sessions, a lot on Mercury and a lot of stuff, because at the same time, Giddings and Lewis is making these rumblings about potentially moving out their headquarters offices out of Fond du Lac because they wanted to build this headquarter office building, would have built it on their parking lot, but not with that building sitting there. Okay, so the pressure is mounting and unbeknownst to a lot of people in the city, um, at, that, at that point in time, there were people inside, even though Mercury was being annexed, there were people, maybe lower level, some higher level, but we were hearing back from people uh, at Giddings and Lewis, oh, the focus is all on Mercury, what about us? You know, we're the second biggest ones, we're a giant tool, machine tool, we're coming back, we're talking about major investment, what about us? Mm -hmm. And the what about us kind of filters up to the state of Wisconsin and the government calls Tommy Thompson as well. Um, it's ironic because Mercury goes through the council annexes in 7-0. And the irony of all of that is, and we can probably talk about that now because it's many years later and it's all been settled, they're in, there was a court settlement. But the, the guy, one of the guys who really had to be given credit, you know, the council was, was, had a lot of foresight to annex it 7 0. Uh, if you, some of the initial resolutions went five, uh, two abstentions or two votes against it, one abstention, all that kind of stuff when they were just going to circulate the petition. Pressure was intense from those workers. Um, but it came down to 7 0. But Tom Aarons in a closed session said just to advise the council, and this is right before the vote. And there were many offers to Mercury at the time. Um, and, and they turned one down and they kind of flipped it on end. There was almost a settlement at the 11th hour to just let them stay out and, and an agreement whereby they would come in, but they changed it again. Management at Brunswick changed it, which really irritated the council. I mean, we're, we're an hour away from voting on this thing. We had no deal. And I remember walking back into the back of the room and telling uh, John St. Peter, I think it was, and Joe Reitemeyer and those guys, we do not have a deal. They said, you're kidding. I said, no, we do not. Wow. And uh, It's probably I not said, an easy conversation to have. Not with an easy conversation. <laughs> um, they they, they kind of look, they so, you know, you're, you're kind of given leadership roles in these things. And they said, you can't do any? I said, this is happening, guys. You know, they... The council is not going to go with this. Yeah. So it was, I made the motion to do the annexation. A guy named Jim Treelevin <laughs> seconded it. Uh, Jim was a great guy. I tell you, from the standpoint of being on council with people, you no know, harder worker, volatile. Some people said we were both volatile. <laughs> um, but, it, but the guy was true to core. He was always there. 
He did so much work and had his ear to the ground all the time, did what was always in the best interest of all of the city, always, always. Not for himself, but for mm -hmm. the city. Um, and you guys so, worked on a big transit project, too, that we, we might that. talk about yeah, later. Yeah, we did that at the end. Yep, we okay. worked on a big transit pro transit uh, project, but many things, including the fire department and a lot of different issues uh, um, that came about. But at any rate, that motion got passed 7-0. Before that meeting, right before that, Tom Aaron said, you know, council, and again, giving credit to Tom Aaron for this statement, and I think it's what really held the council together on that. He suggested, he said, you know, council, it's easier to annex and then negotiate them out than to drop the whole annexation and try to do this over, which is true because you, you then are in a position of being able to, to give some correct. And in all honesty, I think the council actually knew it was going to go to court, probably thought there would be a settlement. Mm -hmm. um, you know, nobody's that naive to believe that it wasn't going to happen, but it happened. Yep. Subsequent to that, uh, or immediately after that, um, at the state level, you, you were talking about um, some pretty high-level people, Secretary of Commerce, Bob Trunzo and these people, uh, made comments in the paper about how Fond du had just burned bridges, we'd never get uh, grants and aids, and it was going to be a problem to get industry in here. We had hurt the reputation of the state. Some of the members of council had called Mr. Trunzo's office, and they had gotten into a real, you know, what kind of match. Okay? Yep, yep. I received a call um, from a uh, city attorney, and I believe it was Larry Tim, might have been Angeli as well, John Angeli as well. Um, and I was on the STS system, which means it's like an intercom, interconference call. I was working for the state. We had the same phone system. Mm -hmm. in a so any call, they could just pick up and punch in four digits and get a hold of me anytime. So they called me. And they told me what was going on. They couldn't get a hold of Ron, um, uh, uh, Ron Nelson at the time. He was a uh, vice president, I believe, at that time. And they couldn't get a hold of him. And they said, Mark, you got to do something. I mean, they're talking, Commerce is talking about not giving us about a million dollars in grants. Wow. And stuff like that. So I said, fine, put in a call. I'll talk to him. <laughs> Which I did, and <laughs> the first words out of Mr. Trunzo's <laughs> the first words out of Mr. Trunzo's mouth were not that complimentary. Um, I said, "Well, well, wait, wait a minute." I said, I, "I'm just calling to apologize." And this is um, the Secretary of Commerce. The Secretary of just Commerce. said that Secretary. was going to pull millions of dollars with the grants, and okay, that's right. Yep. So I'm talking to them. Most of my colleagues did not know that con conversation took place, but I apologize for them. Um, I said, I'm your, I said, I'm on your side. I said, you know, don't, you know, we didn't like to do it. We had thought we had a deal with Mercury. We didn't. Some mistakes were made along the way, maybe by both sides, da, 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 da. Conversation goes on. He makes a comment about, hey, you're a really reasonable guy. Um, it sounds like, it, you know, I'd like to meet you sometime. I do get to Madison mm -hmm. because of the job that yeah, I had. Your day like, job. I was a, right, my day job, I was a, a a manufacturing manager, assessment manager for an entire region. I had to go to Madison about once a month, sometimes twice a month. So I told him, yeah, I get down there, maybe we can have a meeting. He said, let me know, and we'll do that. And I did do that. That becomes important in the scheme of the roofing deal, okay? So time goes on. We had that, uh, we had uh, uh, the uh, uh, conversation relative to Mercury, but you gotta remember, Everything was moving along for the council, not just Mercury in those time periods. So in closed sessions, we were talking about things. And as I mentioned to you, um, I came, council was invited <laughs> to the Galloway House and Village. There was some event uh, at Christmas time, and we were invited. And my wife and I hadn't been here in a while. We said, let's go. You know, I want to just go. She was looking at a lot of the stuff around, and I went back, and I'm looking at maps. And I think we just came from looking at the map um, that probably looked a lot like this. It was a bigger map, but you can see where the, the river at one time went. I yep. saw that map, and I actually had a more recent map, and I don't know if I have it in this pile. I, guess. I, got, I have too many, too many maps and too many things, I guess. 
uh, relative to this. But at any rate, I had an aerial photograph that was taken sometime in the 80s of the city of Fond du Lac that showed the river being in a different location. And I also remember that from some of the sketches we have seen. And I started thinking about that. And I looked back at that and I went back and got the aerial and I thought, huh, that's kind of an interesting proposition because where the river was happened to be, from all the data we had received at that point, where the most contamination was. And again, fortunate for the city, fortunate for the council, Fortunate for a lot of people, I'm an assessor, right? I was an assessor, state assessor. Worked with maps, worked with stuff. Real estate broker, certified appraiser, all of that kind of stuff. And I knew from all of that, that if a river and a riverbed exists, it's the property of the state, okay? So we moved the river, right? Mm -hmm. And I was thinking as I looked at those maps and I went home that night and I thought, hey, I wonder if they ever transferred title to Rooping Leather for the river. All from seeing the map of the All river. All from right? seeing the map here. <laughs> from seeing the map here. That triggered that. Uh, you know, I never, I we'd seen other maps before, but I'd never really seen that. But I saw that and I thought, that's interesting. Also because I'm an assessor, there is such a thing as an assessor's plat. And what an assessor's plat allows, it's 70.27 of the statute. If an assessor finds that they cannot define where an existing property line is, they can go out and just go like this. I think that line is right here. Mm -hmm. And then they create what's called an assessor's plat. Yep. They define where the boundary is. So we're in a closed session in, I believe it was in February, and I said to Tom Aarons, I said, Tom, I'd like you to go back and explain some of this to my fellow council people. I'd like you to go back and I'd like you to check, I believe it was back to 1900 is what I had given him. Go back and see if you can find anywhere in the record where, where the state of Wisconsin did a quick claim deed to the Rooping Leather company, property, family for that riverbed. Which is essentially would have meant a transfer of, of the land. To a the transfer river. of the yep. land to okay. Roping Letters, which would have meant they owned it, yep. now we would have owned it. And I explained to my colleagues about this assessor's plat. Okay. Okay. They came back and there was a, a, a actual abstracting that was done, pretty involved abstracting um, that they went through. And in all of that, um, the long and short of it was they couldn't find anything. They couldn't find any transfer of it. Jack Howley, the then uh, city manager, had asked Tom Aarons, well, what do you think about this concept of, of Weber's where we could you know, tell the DNR, hey, it's yours, you've got the problem, we'll keep ours and clean up ours. Well, Tom Aarons came back and said, well, I don't know if that's going to work um, because you need two separate owners. What Tom was missing and what Jack Howley and some of these people were missing was if the river had never been transferred, you now have the state of Wisconsin Correct. and real yep. so You have two owners, yep. right? And you're gonna define who owns what, okay? So when we got into, and this is actually from the closed session of March 13th, here was my little note, 33 of 91. That was from M. Weber to, to the council and to, to uh, some of the staff, uh, which came before this closed session. But the long and short of it was this. There was a motion by Councilman Weber that at the proper time under 6605 of the statutes, we file a complaint with the circuit court for an order to raise the building due to its hazardous conditions. Two, inform the judge that the city intends, this is the judge who is judging the bankruptcy, that the city intends to take the building down under the provisions of 6605 of the statutes. Point three, the city council, once we know where the highest level of contamination is, have an assessor's plat made, okay? And we kind of knew where it was. We did have a lot of documents and, and some of them, you know, they show like this. You can see where the old riverbed was 
And you can see where there was chromium over here, just so people see this is where the old river bend went, and this is the property that there was, and here's where the river was now. So the council was seeing a lot of stuff. Okay, so we're back to where we were with the assessor's plat. So once we knew um, where the heaviest contamination was, we were going to create this, quote, assessor's plat. Okay. Um, we were also going to reconfigure the tax incremental district number four and wrap it very tightly around Giddings and Lewis. And we actually did do that. That is, that is the actual TID district for that one. And what I meant by that, um, I actually went out with the city engineers because they actually redid this. Originally, this was the TID district. Okay. We went out and wrapped the entire building because if you look, there's some minor buildings up there that are along Giddings and Lewis that if they expanded, those little minor buildings would have probably come down. Yep. There's another reason for that. Um, you want to encompass most of the industrial land because what happens a lot of times if a building goes away, they depreciate over time, a lot of functional obsolescence, but the land value recovers. If it's clean, yep. the land value is worth more. Yep. So, and being an assessor, I knew that. So I'm trying to capture as much for the city taxpayers as I can by encompassing that land yep. and getting as much. So that was why um, we were going to um, reconfigure that. Point number five was approach Giddings and Lewis to bring forward a building plan, and point number six was instruct the staff to hire an abstractor to review the title to determine when and who issued approval to move the old riverbed. So all of this was being discussed in closed session. What I told you and having seen that, they had all, council had already known about that. Yep. They did do the abstract and um, I think it was Terry Rudolph who actually did it and he went back into the 30s but in what as it turns out later um, in some of the investigations that the DNR that the DNR put forward we found that in 1929 a date was mentioned but 1918 was also mentioned so it sounded like somewhere between 1918 and 1929 is when that riverbed got moved. Yep. And in those documents that the DNR provided, it said, and I, uh, I can just find that one comment um, from the DNR. The contamination, this was in August, the contamination is most likely a result. Now remember, the building came down in July. We were already tearing this building down. Contamination is most likely a result of the filling of the old river channel with tannery waste and the discharge of tannery wastewater into the municipal system. Sometime later, in those same DNR reports, they specifically mentioned that again, that there was old containers in that. So what I had assumed from the information I had gotten, the chromium stuff, the barrels, and I don't think people realize that even with Lakeside Park, a lot of Lakeside Park north of Scott Street was filled with waste from the tannery, etc. That was all cattails. Go back to the library and look at Langdon Divers pictures and stuff and yep. you'll see that. So this was a common occurrence at that time. And that's how that got filled in. So the hot spot was created by that. The reason for all of this was Wisconsin, state of Wisconsin, if if you didn't give us that us being now uh, what was Roopings and could potentially become City of Fondelax problem, if you didn't give it to us, you're going to own it. Yeah, you're on the hook. You're going to be on the hook. Yeah. So that was the presentation was made. Shortly after that, um, I think is when Giddings and Lewis came forward with kind of a drawing and a plan to build this new office building there, but only if the Roping Leather building is gone. Mm -hmm. Fall back to Mr. Trunzo now. I had met with Mr. Trunzo, the two, secretary, secretary, the secretary, of, Commerce. secretary yep. of Commerce, two, three times down in Madison. Um, staff did not know that. City Council did not know that. Um, I did not. I was not sanctioned by them to go down there and talk to them, to talk to him. But I never talked about closed session stuff. Mm -hmm. I talked more in what I call glittering generalities, okay, about what we would need. I mentioned to him about, you know, the fact that people at Giddings and Lewis um, were a little upset about all the attention being played to mercury and, 
you know, everything that the governor had bought. I think he bought a boat and a motor and everything from Mercury. And it's like, what has the governor done for me yeah. now? This is Mr. Fife who's on the cover of Fortune magazine, you know. Yeah. Um, so it was like, it was like, Mr. Trunzo, what can you do for us? And he listened very intensely. Mr. Trunzo was a very good guy. Um, he listened and we talked about what, what do you think we could do? I said, well, the major thing is going to be help with the DNR. We're going to need them to do some things, you know, to, for us to be able to take that building down because we cannot assume a two to ten million dollar cleanup of a property. Okay, so Mr. Trunzo was in in place. Okay, this is all in place. We went into closed session when this came forward, and I mentioned to council, this is it. This is our time. Mm -hmm. There was a meeting that was scheduled for me and Mr. Dobbins and Mr. Nelson were the president and vice president of the council. They were going to be the ones to attend this meeting along with Mr. Hawley and, and some of the people. And um, we were going to discuss many of these items, trying to get the DNR to give waivers. And they never really did. Um, they, they got through the meeting. It wasn't going very well. Okay, they just couldn't get it. But Mr. Trumzel was there at that meeting. Um, other high-level people from the DNR were there. And then at one point, I remember Ron Nelson telling me, you know, we came up with your idea of dividing the property north and south. Yep. We brought up the idea of doing the plat, that this, we believe that the riverbed had never been formally deeded to them, that this likely could be property of the state. What could be done? And when they talked about the dividing, the long and short of it was, and in the article um, that was written in the paper, they said that they agreed. The DNR said basically they were agreeing. And what it's called is something called natural attenuation, okay? Natural, where the, where the contamination goes, attenuates itself naturally. Okay. So you put a, a clay cap and a topsoil cap over something that was done on many industrial properties, I know. I did environmental. Uh, uh, appraisals and made discussions around the state relative to other environmentally impaired properties. So I was well aware of what, what might be able to be done if they would go along with this. But they did go along with that, the idea that the property could be split um, and that we could divide it. The southern portion that right now has a mound of dirt sitting there uh, by the transfer station uh, south of uh, Marine Credit Union, that became the southern parcel. The northern parcel was going to be the responsibility for us to clean up. And from many of these documents that I have here, you will see that um, it was something that was doable at that time. There was some asbestos, there were some minor, minor VOCs, but it was doable. The stuff where the chromium was, that's a little more dicey. We had to do some test wells under Do Doty Street, which you saw or will see by these maps. You know, the river where the river channel went, they filled mm -hmm. that in too. Um, so the long and short of it, coming to the Galloway house back in December of that year and seeing those maps kind of tripped the trigger. Yeah. Because the result, and you have to take a step back, Tom Aaron's telling Jack Howley that the assessor's plaid was not something that um, we were going to be able to do, and yet in the end, I have a resolution somewhere here and amongst all these papers uh, where we did do just that. We did an assessor's plat. Um, we did the division that they said couldn't be done. Um, we went out there and kind of the line. I went through and did the re redoing of the, the TID district. Um, one thing, and, and we haven't got to it, so eventually, inevitably, uh, I remember Ron Nelson calling me after the meeting. He said, Mark, he said, uh, they bought the Weber deal. <laughs> Ron was, I, I love the guy. He was always short to the point, but he was one of the greatest guys. Great, great supporter of the parks. He'd do anything for the parks. He'd do anything for the school kids. He was a great guy. They were all great guys on that council. Um, uh, we did things that a lot of people probably as a group could not have done, but they all had expertise. I mentioned to you, John Dobbins, uh, there was something from a police or 
that kind of a standpoint, he was the guy uh, from the from the parks or the or the schools. It was Ron Nelson. Uh, Zeller was the guy with economic development stuff. We would go back to him and ask questions about stuff like that. Jim, he was the guy. He kept his nose to the grindstone and he worked his tail off to get stuff for the city. So uh, Ralph Leiston, he was he was go out, all these guys would go out and talk to people and bring back information that was vital to the council. So. It was great from that standpoint, but I remember when he said that, and I remember Dobbins the time when they swung the ball and started cracking, you know. I remember him at the ceremony saying, uh, you know, Mark Weber's idea to divide the parcel, you know, led us to, to this and that and the other thing, and it's all great, but it got done. One thing before we leave, I thought this was cute. This was on July 22nd of 1992, so now it's a year later after we've taken the roofing building down. It says roofing, U.S. success story. And if you read the article, what's really interesting is how all of these upper level government people, you know, Congress and all these people saying, hey, this is how you do it. This is how you re redo everything and how you, and I'm thinking the people who carried the water weren't you guys. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so I always, I always thought when, when I ended my classes and when I talked <laughs> about this, when I talked about this, I would put this slide up at the end, roofing. U.S. success story, yeah. and I'm thinking, you should know what we went through and what we had to do to get this stuff done from, from... It says right here, but now a congressional organization is doing quite a bit of bragging about the roofing site. Typical oh, politics, right? Oh, for sure, for so, sure. It, it, I thought that was just great. Thank you for sharing that story and fleshing that out. I think that's uh, uh, your indications about how history plays an important role in the future, I think, also ring very true. Um, before we go, I want to talk about one more thing. Um, you had a controversial uh, Lakeside Park um, ordinance that passed uh, back in the day, and we have some signs and some bumper stickers to share, uh, if you're comfortable. Uh, sure, sure. Um, it's kind of ironic because people may not remember, but there was a parking ban after 11 o'clock. I'm not sure if those are all in place or not anymore. Uh, it changed over the years, but at that time, there was no easy way to close Lakeside Park. Couldn't put gates up. People went out there and fished. Was there a way of doing this? And we came to the conclusion in, amongst the council, well, yeah, there was a way of doing this, and it was called a parking ban after mm -hmm. a certain time. Yep. Just not let people park out there. And they said, well, what about the fishermen? Well, you could park and walk in if you wanted to, to uh, fish out there, um, but you had to look at the greater good. And, and one of the things that, that came to the forefront, there were, they were having seances out there on the rocks and lighting candles, and they were having drug issues after 11 o'clock. As, wow. as the city, you know, the police officers would tell us a lot of things. The one issue where the seniors used to complain was when they drive through the park with the kids drinking, making a lot of noise, throwing stuff. And, and it was like the kids needed a place to go. This is where they went. The older people didn't feel, they felt intimidated. It's like they were losing their park, okay? And so how do we get that back? Well, after one of those guys actually committed suicide, jumped off the parking ramp uh, oh, over on, uh, on Macy Street, um, you know, uh, that happened. There was another one where there was an overdose and some, some other things. Council came to the conclusion, we're going to try something. We're going to do this parking ban. Okay. I think... So the, the ban was between 11 p.m. and 4 a.m. You could not park you could not in park. Lakeside Park. You could not park and in it was Lakeside to Park. Remedy some of the, the crime and some of the loitering and things that you had just mentioned. That okay. I had just mentioned. And okay. the biggest thing was... 11 o'clock was kind of picked because parks in southeast Wisconsin closed at 11 o'clock. They gate them and shut them, but people would come up here. And the, the police officers even told us at the time, a lot of the problems that occur out there weren't coming from city people at that time. They were coming from out-of-town people. So it was like, who are we really serving here? Who are we attempting to? I remember the ordinance, I think, had Jim's name on it, Jim Treelevin's name on it at the time. And... Um, I remember I came, my father-in-law had passed away. I missed that meeting. Ralph Leiston was the, the council president. I had missed to, I got back home from the wake that night. I turned on the TV and I'm seeing all these people in the audience and it's 3-3, they couldn't get anything. Um, I so actually, you were you were gone from the meeting. I wasn't at the meeting. It's I was a 3-3 boat. Yep. You could see the park 
people, uh, the people who were protesting, you know, and there were some protest groups, people have a right to protest, won't go into all the stuff that was done to my, you know, threats and all stuff thrown at the house and all that kind of stuff. But some things don't change. <laughs> no, some things do not change. Continue. You know, they, but this was a flyer that was put out. I came back. I was running for council. This is 1990 when this happened. I'm running for re-election. And there is a there is a uh, flyer that's put out as you can see it. Is this Lakeside Park or is this Weber Park? Weber's Park. <laughs> because I came back after the wake, drove down to the city council meeting um, from my father-in-law's wake, came in, flipped my light on, now I'm in attendance and voted 4-3 to pass that ordinance. Okay? Wow. It was not gonna go through. And there was no way I was going to let that thing fail. It, we were going to try it. I was going to do it. So I kind of got tagged with it. Besides, I was running for election. Those other guys that were voting for it, most of them weren't. Yeah. Okay. Um, this is the picture I showed you of that same group. You can maybe... Uh, they don't like the park ordinance and they're protesting in the park. These members of Citizens for Park Rights hold signs voicing their displeasure with a city ordinance that closes Lakeside Park from 11 p.m. to 4 a.m. The sign says, this car has been Weberized. It disappears at 11. <laughs> and here oh. is, and here's I was fortunate, <laughs> Greg Stenslin got me a bumper sticker. <laughs> this Good old Weberized. Greg got me a bumper sticker. I now have that. I have a uh, bar wow. in my basement, oh. and I have all these articles and headlines, and this, this bumper sticker is underneath the bar. It says Weberized. Wow. So, you know, it's not something you're, you're, you know, you go through a lot. As you know, Ben, you mm -hmm. go through a lot when you're on city council. People people think and take this for granted that you're not, you know, you're not human. You got kids that go to school. You go to churches. You go around town. Heck, we even had a thing that they called sound off. You could call to the paper and say anything. Didn't have to put your name. Then you had another little thing called uh, letters to the editor, name withheld upon request. Let me tell you. Oh, so you could write anonymous letters to the editor. And, and I could show you a lot of them during the fire department issue where it was name withheld upon request you know um you know weber can take his hose garden hose and hope he doesn't you know have a fire and all this kind of stuff you know things like that mm -hmm. that came up during those time periods so there there were a lot of nasty things but you live through them yeah, you survive absolutely. them um yeah and and the irony of all of that was as as much as eventually we closed the ninth street station we cut back on the fire department when I came back on council in 94 and 95, Jim Trelevin and I, who kind of led the charge in, in getting them, ended up supporting much of what the fire department was attempting to do at that time. And a lot of those guys said, isn't it ironic that Weber and Trelevin are now on our side? Yeah, supporting it the wasn't. I'll, I will tell you this, Ben, and I told this to some people, I didn't know there were sides. I always thought there were just issues. Yeah. That's just how I thought about mm -hmm. things. There were just issues. Yeah. And sometimes you're on this side of the issue, sometimes you're not. And it's funny because it did change. Yeah. I had people when I ran for council said, you know, we really like you, Mark, but we're not sure which side you're on. And I would bring that same comment up. I didn't I didn't know there were sides. I just yeah. thought there were issues. So because your role as a council member is to look at the issues and make the best decision, right? Exactly. And, and the issues be, change. Yeah. As as it did with groupings, as as did a lot of things. Um I you know, like I said, we've lost three of those members of that council. John Dobbins has passed away, John Zeller has passed away, Andy Hunwacker. I think uh, Ron Nelson, I know, left with his wife, went to Minnesota. I know Jim's around here somewhere. Mm -hmm. I know um uh, Ralph Leiston, his son lives across from me. He's 88 years old now. He's still around here. So there are people that are still around here from that council. Um, and and uh, it, it was a great, and there are at least four of us that I know of that are still uh, living. There's even members, you know, Mr. Rickmeyer, who I didn't really get along with all the time. He passed away. Miss Metaleski, she passed away. Uh, Jim Mitzel, who I agreed with a number of times, disagreed with, he's passed away. Many of those people who you served with have, have passed away, um, but they all deserve credit. Absolutely. Um, they were w willing to give up their time. Yep. So. And, and we appreciate you, you know, coming on the show and talking about some of these things, because these are the things you 
really probably won't be able to read in a history book. I mean, there's not a nope. history book about, uh, you know, the dealings of city council members no. or, no. you know, and even some of those council members and their contributions to the community as a whole. History here helps mm -hmm. people who go back in history yep. and keep records of it um, really, really do themselves a favor. When I hear kids, you know, I talk to my granddaughter and I talk to her about uh, Pearl Harbor and, and some of these things. She says, what's, you know, Pearl Harbor, what, where do you hear that? You don't hear it. Well, if you don't know history, you're destined to make the same mistakes Absolutely. that history makes. Well, thanks again for coming on, Mark. Um, hopefully the first episode, you know, is a success and we have a lot of viewers that watch and uh, maybe in the future we'll have more topics to hey, discuss. Hey, be fun. Be fun. <laughs> Just let me know. Thanks. Yeah, you bet.